The title of the sermon this morning is The Image of the Invisible God. This will be a good way to end the year at our church, The Image of the Invisible God. Today, in our society, in our culture, there are many attacks on the deity of Jesus Christ, on the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ, the significance of Christ. Many different attacks on Jesus Christ today. Jews, and this is nothing new, Jews, for example, they deny that Jesus is God. They deny the Messiahship of Jesus. They are still waiting for their Messiah. Muslims claim that Jesus was just a prophet, but no greater than Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad is, is a greater prophet than Jesus. Uh, Muslims believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He didn't rise from the grave. And then there's Mormons. Mormons deny the Trinity, which means they deny that Jesus is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. They believe that Jesus is actually the first creation of God the Father. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus is just a mere angel. Liberal Christians deny that Jesus is God or the only way to God. They believe as long as you're really a good person, that's all that matters. Uh, you can believe in whatever you want to believe. Just be a good person. Roman Catholics have a fairly orthodox Christology, but not necessarily in practice because they place so much emphasis on the veneration or what I call the worship of Mary that they detract from the significance, the preeminence, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And so you have all of these groups, and I could go on and on, who decrease and take away from the significance of Jesus Christ. Well, the same thing was happening in the first century, and it's the reason why Paul wrote this very special letter of Colossians. The main reason that Paul wrote Colossians was as a polemic, which, had, which means it was a rebuke, it was a correction of error. And the reason why he, he wrote Colossians was because there, because there were false teachers who had infiltrated the church. And these false teachers were an early form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism, you can read more about it online. Gnosticism didn't really arise until the second and the third century. But the early forms of Gnosticism you can see in the, um, the false teachers in the, New, in the New Testament era, in that first century time. And this is what they believed, the, the false teachers who were in the city of Colossae, who were um, attacking the church. And what I mean by attacking, they were, they were in the church teaching false doctrines. And they, they taught, first of all, that matter is evil. That anything that you can touch, feel, and see, matter, matter is evil. The only thing that's good is, is things from the spirit world. And since matter is evil, they claim that God could not have created matter. Instead, what they believe is that God delegated creation to angelic beings, to angels. Angels were the ones who created everything, and they believe that Jesus was just one of these angels. Jesus was one of the angels that God delegated the work of creation to. They also believed that these angels, and, and they, were, they were highly involved in angel worship, and so they believed that these angels controlled the interaction between God and man. Um, they believed that there was this realm between God and man, and that the angels were in that realm, this middle realm. And that the angels, you could not communicate directly to God. You had to, to communicate to God through angelic beings. And so that's why they believed you had to communicate with angels, pray to angels, worship angels, because that was the only way that you could communicate with God. They believed that these angels controlled people's lives. And so they believed that by worshiping these superior angels, that the superior angels would subdue the evil demons, the evil angels. And so these Gnostic false teachers were bringing this false teaching into the church. And that's why Paul wrote the letter of Colossians. And specifically, the passage that we're going to look at today is a correction of all of this detraction from Christ, lessening the importance of Christ. Paul wrote this letter to say, Jesus Christ is preeminent. Jesus Christ is supreme. And we're going to see that this morning. Uh, Colossians 1 Verses 15 through 23, one of the most important Christological, Christological means the study of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. So everybody has a Christology. Mormons have a Christology. Roman Catholics have a Christology. You have a Christology. I have a Christology. We have to make sure that our Christology is Bible-based, comes from the Bible. It's accurate. 
So this is one of the most important Christological passages in the Bible. Rome, uh, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 23. Now remember what Paul is doing here. He's correcting this false teaching that has infiltrated the church. He says of Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 21, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Ten reasons for the supremacy of Christ. Ten reasons for the supremacy of Christ. Number one, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Verse 15 says he is the image of the invisible God. First of all, I want you to notice the word invisible. That God is invisible. You know, Mormons believe that God is not invisible, that God is not a spirit. God has a body with flesh and blood and bone just like us. That God used to be just like us. Um, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is a spirit and that God is invisible. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. But Jesus, one of the things that makes his incarnation so special is that he came to show us what God is like. He came to reveal God. The word image, when it says Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the word image is the Greek word icon. That's where we get our word icon. And it refers to an exact visible representation of something or someone. An exact visible representation. One translation says that Jesus is the very incarnation of the unseen God. Now, one of the reasons that Jesus came to earth, his primary reason was for our redemption, but one of the reasons was to reveal God the Father to us. In the Old Testament, God was invisible. And up to the time of Jesus, God was invisible. And Jesus came to show us more clearly who God really is. John called Jesus the Word. He called him the Word, which in Greek is logos. And it means God's message to us. Jesus is God's message to us, God's revelation to us, God's communication to us. God wanted, us to, show, wanted to show us more of who he really is, so he sent his son Jesus to do that. Hebrews 1-2 says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. In John 14.9, he said, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus came to reveal God the Father to us. And what did Jesus reveal about God? He revealed the perfection of God's moral na nature. Jesus revealed that God is morally perfect in his love, in his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says of Jesus, he did, not know, uh, he did not know sin. Hebrews 4.15 uh, 4, says of Jesus, he has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. 1 John 3, 5 says there is no sin in him. For John 1, 14, he is full of grace and truth. 
So Jesus came and showed us God's perfect moral nature. And so he is the image of the invisible God. And for this reason, Jesus is supreme overall. Okay, number two. Second reason for the supremacy of Christ is that he is the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn over all creation. That's what it says in verse 15. The firstborn over all creation. This is one of the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible. Many cultic groups, such as the Arians, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, they use this phrase that Christ is the firstborn over all creation as a proof text for their belief that Christ is not eternal. He's not a co-eternal with God the Father. That Christ had a beginning. He was created. Uh, he, he, is, he hasn't been around forever and ever and ever. But the term firstborn is not what, what you might think. The term firstborn has to do with the position of rank and privilege and authority usually passed down from the father to the eldest son. And so when it says that Christ is the first, firstborn, it's not making a statement about Christ's uh, duration, about Christ's eternality, about Christ's beginning. It's making a statement about Christ having position, rank, privilege, authority over all of creation. That God the Father is handing over authority to his Son. That Christ is the heir to the throne. And just as a king would hand over the, the dominion of his kingdom, the control of his kingdom, the leadership of his kingdom to his eldest son. Well, that's what it means when Jesus is the firstborn, that God has given Christ all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 28 18, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, this is what he said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so it's interesting that in the Bible, Isaac and Jacob, for example, they were not born first, but they were given the privileges of the firstborn. The Bible refers to Israel as God's firstborn, even though it was not the first nation. The Bible refers to King David as the firstborn, but King David was not the first king, nor was he the firstborn son in his family. And so these were all called the firstborn, even though uh, they weren't firstborn, actually. And so this statement, firstborn, this term has nothing to do with someone's age or how early they were born. It's talking about rank, position, privilege, authority. And that's what I mean. God has delegated all authority to his son, Jesus Christ, making him supreme over all. Number three, he is the creator of everything. Jesus is the creator of everything. Colossians 1.16 says, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, there are three prepositions that are used in this verse to describe Christ's relationship with creation, by, through, and for. It says all things were created by him. All things were created through him. All things were created for him, which means everything was created for Christ's glory and for his pleasure and for his purposes and for his will. John 1.3 reiterates this. It says, all things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. Hebrews 1.2, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Now, in Colossians 1.16, notice the phrase, visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, Bible scholars disagree about what this means, but most believe what this is talking about is a hierarchy of angelic beings an angelic hierarchy, four classes of angelic beings. And remember that the false teachers at the time, they worshiped angels, and they believed that Christ was merely one of the angels. And what Paul is saying here is that Jesus Christ is the creator of the angels. He's not one of the angels. He created them. Not only that, but they were created for him, 
for his purposes, for his service, for his glory. This verse, Colossians 1.16, is also a statement of Christ's deity, that Christ is actually God. Here, the Bible says that Jesus is the creator. All things have been created by him, through him, for him. Well, who is the creator according to the Old Testament? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus created the heavens and the earth, then Jesus is God. So this is a statement, an affirmation of his deity. Number four, fourth reason for the supremacy of Christ is that he is before all things. He is before all things. That's what it says in verse 17. He is before all things. This refers to Christ's eternality. Christ had no beginning, no origin, no source. He was not created. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist. He is eternal, co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And this is the doctrine of the Trinity. There is one God who exists and three co-eternal, co-equal persons. And so God the Father is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Son, and likewise with God the Holy Spirit. And remember, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Arians, these Gnostic false teachers, they were teaching that Christ is not eternal. He's not on the same level as God, that he had a beginning. Paul says he is before all things. John 1, 1 through 2 says it like this, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And remember, he's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Never speaks of Christ's creation. John 8, 58, Jesus, he said, Truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, Jesus lived hundreds of years after Abraham, the father of the Jews. And yet Jesus was saying, before Abraham was created, before Abraham existed, I was. Jesus was making a statement about his eternality. In Revelation 22, 13, listen to the words of Jesus. I am the Alpha and the what? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so Jesus is eternal. He was there before the creation of the universe because he created it. He's supreme because he is before all things. Number five, fifth reason for Christ's supremacy is he holds all things together. He holds all things together. It's what it says in verse 17. And by him, all things hold together. In other words, Jesus sustains creation. He didn't just create. He also holds it together. He sustains creation. Uh, The ESV study Bible says he prevents creation from falling into chaos and disintegrating. Phillips' translation says Jesus is the upholding principle of the whole scheme of creation. Another Bible translation says, And all things depend upon him for their existence. Hebrews 1.3, it says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word, by the word of his mouth. And so Christ is not merely the creator, he is the sustainer. He holds all things together. He keeps things going. He keeps things working. He keeps things alive. He keeps things spinning. He keeps things safe. Now, the religion of deism, which was popular around the time of our country's founding, teaches that God created the universe and then stepped back. And now he's completely transcended. He's not imminent. He's not involved with his creation. He's completely transcendent and has nothing to do with his creation. He's aloof. He's uninvolved. And therefore, that's why they don't believe in miracles. Not because God, there isn't a God, or not because God can't do miracles, but because God doesn't. He's not involved. A miracle would be a supernatural intervention in creation. God doesn't do that. He is just completely transcendent. They don't believe in miracles. That's why they don't believe in the resurrection and all the miracles in the Bible, all the miracles during the time of Moses, all the plagues. They don't believe in any of that stuff because God is, he's existent, but he is transcendent. But 
when it says that Jesus holds all things together, what it's saying is that God is not just transcendent. He is also eminent. He's also involved, highly involved. Jesus Christ keeps your heart beating. He's the one who keeps your lungs breathing, your brain thinking. He prevents disease from consuming your body. You are alive today only because of Jesus Christ, whether you're a Christian or not. He's the one who's sustaining you, who has kept you alive out of his mercy for this long. He's holding you together. He prevents mankind from completely destroying each other in their sin. He keeps the planet spinning. He keeps the sun burning. Jesus prevents meteors from destroying the earth. He keeps rivers flowing and the waves breaking. He keeps the salt water salty and the fresh water fresh. He makes sure that the sun doesn't burn too hot or get too cold. He makes sure the planets are just the right distance from one another. He keeps his eye on everything in creation at all times. He knows how many hairs are on your head, how many cells make up your body. He knows it when a bird falls from the sky and he's holding everything together. Without Christ, it would all fall apart immediately. Christ is supreme. Number six, sixth reason for the supremacy of Christ is that he is the head of the church. He's the head, and that word headship refers to leadership, authority. The boss, Christ is in charge of the church. We can learn much about the church from this body metaphor, this body analogy that is used in the Bible. The church is the body of Christ. Let me just give you a few uh, ideas about what we can learn from the body analogy. If the church is a body, then that means the church is used by Christ to accomplish his purposes. Christ is in heaven, physically. He's in heaven. And he sent the Holy Spirit to work through his body. We are his hands and feet. So we're the ones and his mouthpiece. We're the ones who preach the gospel. We're the ones who help the needy. We're the ones who do his work. We're his body. The body is made up of many members. Think about your body. It has many different members, many different parts. Same thing with the church. There are many different parts in the body, and each part plays an essential, crucial role, an important part. If we're a body, then that means we're connected to each other. And if we're connected to each other, that means we affect each other. When something good happens to you, it affects us. When something bad happens to you, it affects us. Whenever you're growing and thriving in the Lord, it's good for the whole church. When you're living in sin and you're rebelling against God, it affects the whole church. The body parts must care for each other. We are all part of the same body. So if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. We need to take care of that body part and nurse it back to health. If we're all part of the same body, then that means we must work together. Think about if the right arm and the left arm were not in cooperation with each other, what that would be like. It would not work very well. As well, if we're a body and Jesus is the head, and that means that we can do nothing without a vital connection to Jesus Christ. We've got to stay close. We've got to stay connected. Okay, so he's the head of the church. Number seven, seventh reason for Christ's supremacy is that he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. This is the second time that this word firstborn is used by Paul in this passage about the supremacy of Christ. He's the firstborn of all creation, and now he says he's the firstborn from the dead. It says in Colossians 1.18, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, Jesus wasn't the first person to ever be raised from the dead, was he? I mean, he raised people from the dead. The apostles raised people from the dead. Uh, people in the Old Testament were raised from the dead. But Jesus' resurrection was first. It was unique in two ways. First of all, he was the only one or the first one to be raised to eternal life. Other people, like Lazarus in the New Testament, he was raised to life from the dead, but he still ended up dying. But Jesus, when he rose from the grave, he lived forever. He ascended into heaven. A second way that Christ's resurrection was unique, and he was the first, was that 
when he was raised to life, he was given a glorified body, the same kind of glorified body that we're promised whenever Jesus comes back. And that was, that's what makes him the firstborn from the dead. And so what this is saying, that he's the firstborn, is that there are going to be others after him. This is really a statement, a promise that because of Christ's resurrection, he was the first to rise to eternal life. He was the first to rise with a new glorified body. That's what we too can look forward to. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Number eight, Jesus is supreme because he is God. He is God. Colossians 1, 19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. <clears throat> that Greek word for fullness is an interesting word. Remember that the Gnostic false teachers believed that there was no direct connection between God and people, that people had to communicate through these angelic beings. Now, the Gnostic teachers had a term for all of the angelic beings, the intermediary beings, and that was the Greek word pleroma. That's the word fullness. And so Jesus, Paul is saying, is the fullness of God, the pleroma of God, all the fullness of God in bodily form. And so Paul is making a direct argument to the Gnostics that Jesus is the fullness of God. Colossians 2.9 says, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Again, this is the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus Christ is God. He's not lesser than God the Father. He's not greater than God the Holy Spirit. He is God. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's the beginning. But there's one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. Number nine, the ninth reason for the supremacy of Christ. He is the only way to peace with God. He's the only way to have peace with God. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven. To reconcile means to reestablish a right relationship or to bring back into a proper relationship. We're going to look more at reconciliation when we come back in January. But in verse 21, it describes our problem. It says that we are hostile to God. We are alienated from God. It says once you were alienated and hostile in your minds expressed in your evil actions. So apart from Christ, we're God's enemies. We're separated. That's what it means when it says we're alienated from God. We're separated from God. We're far from God. And when you die separated from God, that's what it means to die in your sins. When you die separated from God, that separation doesn't just evaporate. That separation continues for eternity. And so we have a big problem. We are God's enemies. We're separated from God. And it says in, in verse 20, and through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself or everything to himself. So Jesus came to bring us back into right, proper relationship with God, to, to, to bridge that gap, that separation. How was this accomplished? How is this reconciliation accomplished through Christ? It says in verse 20, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Verse 22 says, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. Anytime you see the word blood used in the New Testament referring to Christ's blood, it's talking about the death of Christ. It's, a, it's not something special in the, the red blood or, or something like that. His red blood wasn't magical. It's talking about his death. His death was in our place for our sins. That's how he bridged the gap. Christ died satisfying the wrath of God against us. And so now God can turn to us 
with favor and acceptance and be reconciled to us. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. And so Jesus is the only way to peace with God, the only way to get right with God, and that's why he's supreme. Number 10, the 10th reason for the supremacy of Christ is that he shed his blood on the cross. And this is what makes him supreme. No other angel did this for us. No other so-called God has done that. No other prophet has done that. Colossians 1.20, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Christ is supreme because of what he went through. He went through the, the most horrifying, most terrible, most painful, torturous death possible to save us from our sins. Christ could have simply saved us by snapping his fingers, by the word of his mouth. You know, by the word of his mouth, he created the heavens and the earth. He created the universe in the beginning God said, let there be light. God created all things just with the word of his mouth. Jesus could have surely saved all mankind just with the word of his mouth. But instead, he chose to suffer and die for you and for me. Compare all the religions in the world to one another. And the thing that separates them is that our God died on the cross. And he's the only one who went to such great lengths to save us. And so his great sacrifice for us makes him supreme. So 10 reasons for the supremacy of Christ. Now, before we close, we need to talk about our response to Christ's supremacy. Our response to his supremacy. Christ is supreme, preeminent, above all. How should we respond to that? Four things. Number one, live for his glory. Live for his glory. Live for him. In verse 16, Colossians 1.16, it says, For everything was created by him. All things have been created through him and for him. And what that means is you were created for Jesus. You were created to live for him, to serve him, to glorify him. We need to devote our lives to living for Jesus and not for ourselves, to pleasing him and not ourselves. Number two, our response to his supremacy is give him first place in everything. Give him first place in everything. It says in verse 18, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Jesus is to be first in your life. He is to be your top priority. He's to be first in every part of your life, first in your finances, first in your affections, first in your time, first in your attention, first in your effort and energy, first in your goals, first in your family, first in your marriage, first in your sexuality, your friendships, your education. I feel like every time I say something good, that ding goes off, kind of like, you got it, just like on a video game. Christ is to be first. Practically, I encourage you to begin to place Jesus first in your life. A good step you can take this year in 2020, this is something, a good thing to do kind of as a New Year's resolution, is to make a commitment to give Jesus the first day of your week, Sunday, Sunday mornings. I'm going to go to church on Sundays. It's going to be my priority. It's going to be my habit, not the exception. Give him the first day of the week. Give him the first hour of your day. Begin each day in prayer and in Bible study. Get alone with your heavenly Father. Spend that quality time. So the first day of the week, the first hour of your day, and then make a commitment in 2020 to give him the first 10% of your finances. Say, God, it all belongs to you. And in honor of that, in recognition of that, I'm going to give you the first 10%, just like you've, you've asked. Give God first place in everything. There's a famous devotional, Christian devotional. It's an old one. And it was written by a man named Oswald Chambers, and it describes the act of making Christ first in your life. The title of it is Our Utmost for His Highest. I love that. That should be our response to Christ's supremacy. Our utmost for His highest. Number three, to respond to Christ's supremacy, we need to pursue holiness before Him. 
pursue holiness before him. Verses 21 through 22, it says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Why did Christ die on the cross? Not merely so that you could go to heaven, but so that with the remainder of your time on earth, you would be holy, faultless, and blameless before God. Pursue holiness in every respect, in every part of your life. Don't allow any sin. I want you this, this year, this new year, go to work on your sin. Go to work. Put that sin to death in honor of Jesus Christ. And then number four, the fourth response is to remain grounded and steadfast in the faith. Remain grounded and steadfast in the faith. All the time we hear about people who have left the faith. They left the church. They stopped believing in God altogether. Remain grounded and steadfast. It says in verse 23, If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. The goal of Christ ultimately dying on the cross is so that whenever we die, and stand before God, that we would not be condemned and sent to hell, but that we would be holy, forgiven, justified before him, so that we could go to heaven, have eternal life. But that is only possible for you if you remain grounded in the faith. Remain grounded and steadfast. Now, the implication is not that that means you can lose your salvation. No. The implication is that if you don't remain grounded and steadfast, you were never saved in the first place. Make sure that your salvation is genuine. And one of the ways we know your salvation is genuine is on the day you die, we can say, you know what? She remained grounded. She remained steadfast. She stayed faithful to Christ her whole life. That's how we know you were saved. Colossians 2.8 says, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Be careful that nobody takes you captive. You stay close to Jesus. Keep him first in your life. Jesus is supreme. He's preeminent. He's highest. He is greatest. He's the King of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. This week we get to celebrate his birthday. Let us give him a gift by giving ourselves completely to him, body, soul, and mind. Amen? Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, which teaches us about Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the preeminent, supreme one, the first and the last. Lord, our faith is in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, for reconciliation with you for the gift of eternal life. All of our hope is in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, for what you endured for us and all that you do for us every single day, sustaining us, holding us together. And Lord, we know how we should respond to your supremacy. We know that we should give you all that we are and all that we have every second of the day. But Lord, we're all sinners. Please forgive us and help us, Lord. Help us now to turn over a new leaf, to start over, to start fresh with you first in our lives before everything else. Holy and pleasing to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.